glorious day in Philadelphia. My name is Scott Stroh. I have the great privilege of serving as the executive director of George Mason's Gunston Hall, and thank you all very much for being here today. As a boy growing up in Philadelphia, my favorite museum and the one that I perhaps remember most vividly was Franklin Court, just a few blocks from where we are today. What I remember most is the large, somewhat dark, subterranean room with row after row of telephones. And as some of you in this room can surely remember, from each of these phones, you could magically call one of a seemingly endless number of people important to the founding of our nation. Standing at your preferred phone on a large board in front of you, you found names and numbers for people like George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Betsy Ross, and of course, George Mason. While I don't remember specifically calling Mr. Mason as a young boy, this powerful and for its day, very high-tech experience offered a personal connection with people from the past that was truly unforgettable. The fabulous room here at the National Constitution Center featuring real-life statues of each delegate at the Constitutional Convention, which we were very fortunate to be able to visit again yesterday, offers an equally personal, powerful, and memorable experience. Importantly, places and experiences such as that found at Franklin Court, the National Constitution Center, Gunston Hall, and countless other museums, and programs such as today's symposium are essential components of our community and of our civic fabric. Opportunities to learn about and discuss the historical context of the issues and ideas still impacting us today, no matter how challenging or difficult, are critically important aspects of our educational system and our process of shared learning as citizens representing a diversity of perspectives, but also sharing a common commitment to each other. This is the power of museums and historic sites, and this is why an understanding of our history is so incredibly relevant and important. As someone we would identify today as a lifelong learner, someone who read voraciously, and as someone who was always willing and in fact loved to share his opinion, George Mason would certainly have agreed with this sen sentiment, and if he could convince himself to leave Gunston Hall, I feel certain he would have been a frequent visitor to museums such as where we are today. So in returning to Philadelphia, it is with equal parts pride and enthusiasm that I am pleased to welcome you on behalf of George Mason's Gunston Hall and the National Constitution Center to today's symposium. The genesis for today's program began over one year ago after Gunston Hall's regent from Pennsylvania, Christian Kahn von Seelen, arranged for a meeting between Jeffrey Rosen and staff from the center and a group of us from Gunston Hall. First, therefore, I want to extend our thanks to both Christian and Jeffrey for the inspiration behind this program. This first conversation over one year ago was far-ranging and energizing, but soon we all collectively came to the conclusion that an exploration of Mason the dissenter offered much of great relevance, importance, and promise. Much work occurred since then in shaping the program, but I'm confident after you hear from our distinguished list of panelists, you will find this to be the case. Equally important, this year Gunston Hall is celebrating the 240th anniversary of the ratification of Mason's seminal work, the Virginia Declaration of Rights, which began in Article I by expressing that all men are by nature equally free and independent and have certain inherent rights of which, when they enter into a state of society, they cannot by any compact deprive or divest their posterity, namely the enjoyment of life and liberty with the means of acquiring and possessing property and pursuing and obtaining happiness and safety. Mason's biographer Jeff Broadwater writes that part of the genius of the Declaration of Rights lay with Mason's ability to combine enlightenment political philosophy with the English legal tradition to express in scarcely two pages the ideology of the American Revolution. Broadwater goes on to say that in giving legal sanction to popular sovereignty, individual equality, and the right to revolt against an oppressive government, Mason codified basic liberal principles not then recognized in American and English law. Mason's Virginia Declaration of Rights served as a foundational document for the Declaration of Independence and ultimately our Bill of Rights and 11 years later, in articulating his reasons for not signing the Constitution, he listed at his first reason the lack of a Declaration of Rights. As such, Mason, who never attended school, rarely left his beloved home at Gunston Hall, 
and who considered his greatest duty and obligation, that of husband and father, existed at the center of a powerful intersection of ideas. Ideas about government and the proper role of the governing authority, ideas about citizenship and the importance of both the people's representation and participation in the government, and ideas about rights and liberties so important that not only must they be safeguarded, they must be fought for. Today we will explore the intersection of these ideas through the lens of Mason's role at the Constitutional Convention and the American tradition of dissent as represented by Mason's courageous decision not to sign the Constitution. But I encourage you all to think about this context and this history not just as something from the past, for even more important than Mason's legacy and historical example is what he can still teach us today about citizenship, public service, rights, and community. In closing, the Board of Regents of Gunston Hall is comprised of members of the National Society of the Colonial Dames of America. Founded 125 years ago, right here in Philadelphia, the legacy and example of patriotism, public service, and historic preservation of the NSCDA is inspirational. And through their efforts, numerous buildings and artifacts of material culture have been saved throughout the United States and in England. The work of the NSCDA has also supported and inspired thousands of students and guests to historic places through the innovative educational programs they have designed and implemented. We have a number of the regents of Gunston Hall, former regents, and members of the NSCDA here with us today. And particularly as the father of two young girls, I'm extremely proud to work with women of such integrity, vision, grace, and generosity. Please join me in acknowledging all our regents, former regents, and members of the National Society with us here today. I would also like just to send a few more final words of thanks, in particular to our first regent, Helen Bragg Cleary, and again to Kristen Kahn von Seelen, who chairs our Declaration of Rights Committee, the staff and volunteers at Gunston Hall, particularly our Director of Education and Guest Experiences, Rebecca Martin, the fabulous team here at the center. They've been absolutely great to work with, specifically Jeff Rosen, Tom Donnelly, Nicandro Ionacci, and Tanaya Neal. I'd like to thank all our presenters and panelists and the over 250 donors who have given um, of their time and of their resources to support the 240th anniversary celebration at Gunston Hall. Finally, I would like to take a very brief moment of personal privilege and thank my mom, who is here with us in attendance today. It was my mom who first took my brother and I to Franklin Court, along with a host of other museums, and my mom that sparked what is today not only my profession, but my passion. So thank you, Mom. Thank you for being here today. Thank you all. Enjoy the presentations. Please take advantage of visiting this amazing museum while you're here today. We hope to see you soon at Gunston Hall. And after the conclusion of the second panel today, please remember that there is a reception in the Delegates Cafe downstairs and we hope to see you there. Now it's my great privilege to introduce Tom Donnelly, Senior Fellow for Constitutional Studies at the National Constitution Center. Thank you. Thank you so much, Scott, and, and thank you so much, everyone, uh, for coming here for this thrilling uh, symposium. Uh, George Mason truly is one of our nation's forgotten founders, and we at the National Constitution Center are so excited to be able to do our part to try to draw attention to his constitutional legacy. Delighted first to welcome our friends from George Mason's Gunston Hall uh, here at the National Constitution Center. They were our close partners for this symposium, um, and they remain great stewards of American public memory, so thank you so much for everything you do for all of us. And in particular, I'd like to thank Scott and also Rebecca Martin uh, for helping to conceive of the idea of this symposium and for all of their great work in making it a reality. It really is. It's going to be a terrific day. You're in for a real treat. Um, I, I mean, really, your, your, your keynote speaker aside, we really couldn't have brought together um, a better collection of scholars and historians to discuss George Mason's legacy. So, thank you. So my mission here this afternoon is a simple one. I just want to set the table for our terrific panelists and then get out of the way and enjoy the constitu constitutional feast uh, with the rest of you in the audience. So to that end, I want to talk about three things very quickly. George Mason the man, George Mason the founder, 
and George Mason, the dissenter. First, a bit about George Mason, the man. So for purposes of this symposium, we've dubbed George Mason the reluctant statesman, borrowing the title from Robert Rutland's tight and highly readable biography of George Mason from several decades ago. And if you want to learn more about Mason's life and work, I, I suggest that you pick it up. It's really a delightful read. But who was George Mason? Well, Thomas Jefferson called him a leader of the first order of greatness. James Madison described him as a powerful reasoner, a profound statesman, and a devoted Republican. And Robert Rutland, Mason's biographer, described him as, quote, one of the generals in the intellectual leadership of the revolution. I love that statement. Adding later that he was, quote, a man bound of contradictions, a slave owner who hated slavery, a gifted politician who loathed petty politics, and a gentleman who trusted the voice of the people. So let's begin with the basics. George Mason was born in the early 18th century to a prosperous family with extended uh, land holdings in Virginia and Maryland. His father died when he was very young, and he was raised by an extraordinary mother who not only just made sure to take care of him, but also drove him to try to better himself. So Mason lucked out with a great mother. I'm sure that's true of you, Scott. I know it's, I, I, I can certainly relate to that as well. Um, but also as a young man, he also lucked into one of the great libraries in the colonies, um, owned by his uncle John Mercer, who was a respected lawyer. So Mason didn't attend college. He didn't pass the bar. Uh, he didn't have any of those formal credentials. Instead, he was committed to self-education, something I think all of us who come to the National Constitution Center can really quite relate to. He pursued a rigorous course of study throughout his life, covering everything from Shakespeare to ancient history, to legal treatises, to political philosophy, to the notes of parliament, to books about Virginia and its laws. He just devoured these books. He would take care of his plantation by day and read by night. It's no exaggeration to say that Mason became one of the brightest intellectuals of the revolutionary generation. Sought after by all of the great Virginians of his day, George, George Washington, for instance, his neighbor, and for much of his life, his very close friend, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, Patrick Henry, Richard Henry Lee, among many others. Turning to Mason's personal life, he would marry, raise a large family. He also oversaw a great estate, Gunston Hall, which he loved and cherished. In fact, in part because of his rich home life and his beautiful estate, he was always reluctant to leave Gunston Hall whenever public service called. But for a man of Mason's gifts, public service called quite often. In summary, here's Rutland's take on Mason the man, just to provide you know, this image at the outset. He was a man, quote, of business, a clear thinker, and a normally friendly neighbor. He was a not hail fellow well met sort of man. The few surviving anecdotes telling of his humor reveal that it was sarcastic rather than lighthearted. In his total makeup, George Mason probably frowned as much as he smiled, but he was a profound thinker a savvy businessman, a generous neighbor, and a devoted family man. So that's a bit about Mason the man, just so you can have that in your mind as we continue to discuss him throughout the symposium. What about, what about George Mason the founder? Now, like most Americans, Mason was initially reluctant to break with Great Britain. However, he was drawn more fully into the emerging conflict by the Stamp Act crisis of 1765. For instance, during this crisis, he sent a letter to a London newspaper criticizing the attitude of the British towards the Americans as that of, quote, a master to a schoolboy. In particular, he was outraged that the Stamp Act denied the colonists some of their most cherished rights as British citizens, including the right to a jury trial. He explained to his British readers, there's a passion in the mind of man, especially a free man, which renders him impatient of restraint. Although still loyal, Mason warned his British readers that similar actions would, quote, produce a general revolt in America. And so it did. And Mason played a key role in shaping it, especially in Virginia. He was a leader with Washington of the Northern Virginia Revolutionaries, helping to author the Fairfax Resolves of 1774. He helped organize the Virginia militia in preparation for war. And he was a leader at the Virginia Convention, helping to frame Virginia's post-colonial constitution. But Mason's lasting constitutional achievement, mentioned by Scott in the intro, was the Virginia Declaration of Rights, which turned 240 earlier this year on June 12th, to be, to be precise. Uh, one of the many things that I love about our friends at Gunston Hall is that if you, you look at their logo on their website, they describe themselves as the home of American rights. I know that's a bold claim, but it's, it's, it's also quite right, so I'm gonna, let me explain. Mason wrote the Virginia Declaration of Rights in 1776. It was adopted actually three weeks before Jefferson's famous Declaration of Independence. 
By then, many of the most familiar episodes in the early revolution had already passed. The Stamp Act, the Townsend Acts, the Boston Massacre, Boston Tea Party, the Intolerable Acts. Shots had already been fired at Lexington and Concord. Importantly, colonial governors loyal to the crown were also on their way out, and so revolutionary leaders in colony after colony had to fill this leadership void. And George Mason, reluctant statesman though he was, helped fill this void in Virginia. The Virginia Convention included many of the Commonwealth's leading lights, including Patrick Henry. But because of his stature, George Mason was chosen to play a leading role, including by serving on the committee to draft a new constitution, which was to be preceded by a statement of rights. Mason described the committee as, quote, overcharged with useless members. <laughs> now, this, this was standard Mason stuff. He hated the drudgery of day-to-day -day politics and the preening of petty politicians. But Mason nevertheless dominated the committee. He took up the laboring war, and he really took the lead in drafting this, the Virginia Declaration of Rights. He also fought hard for its approval on the convention floor, beating back, chal beating back challenges by many of the more conservative delegates. Here's how the convention journal describes Mason's defense of his draft. Mason used oratory, quote, neither flowing nor smooth, but his language was strong, his manner most impressive, and strengthened by a dash of biting cynicism when provocation made it seasonable. While the Virginia delegates would revise Mason's initial draft, most notably enlarging the list of rights to include a right to a free press, a regulated militia, and a ban on cruel and unusual punishment, the final document was still very much Mason's. What's most striking when you read the Virginia Declaration today is the degree to which its words still resonate, embodying many of the constitutional values still at the core of American constitutionalism. For Mason and his fellow delegates, the Declaration was to serve as, quote, the basis and foundation of government, and so it did, both in Virginia and actually throughout the nascent republic. For those of you who haven't read Mason's Declaration or haven't read it recently, I would say after the symposium, go and read it. It's a short. It's only two pages. Um, uh, but it really is deeply profound. Uh, regardless, it's worth pausing right now on a few of its most resonant passages, so, just so they echo in our ears as we discuss his constitutional legacy in the panels to follow. For instance, take the, Dec the Virginia Declaration's bold vision of liberty and equality adopted three weeks before Jefferson's Declaration. Scott read it at the outset, but I think it's, it's useful to repeat it again because it's so powerful and profound. Here it is that all men are by nature equally free and independent and have, inherent, have certain inherent rights of which when they enter into a state of society, they cannot by any compact deprive or divest their posterity, namely the enjoyment of life and liberty with the means of acquiring and possessing property and pursuing and obtaining happiness and safety. Powerful stuff. Or take the Virginia Declaration's commitment to popular sovereignty, a commitment that was important to Mason and that is echoed in the US Constitution's own opening, we, the people. Here's the Virginia Decla Declaration. That all power is vested in and consequently derived from the people. That magistrates are their trustees and servants and at all times amenable to them. In other words, in America, we the people rule and our elected officials are there to serve us. Or take its commitment to the project of constitutional reform and even constitutional revolution. Words that reverberate in the American revolutionary experience and in tamer forms in the preamble in Article 5 of the Constitution. Here's the Virginia Declaration. That government is or ought to be instituted for the common benefit, protection, and security of the people, the nation, or community of all the various modes and forms of government that is best, which is capable of producing the greatest degree of happiness and safety, and is most effectually secured against the danger of maladministration, and that whenever any government shall be found inadequate or contrary to these principles, a majority of the community hath an indubitable, unalienable, and indefeasible right to reform, alter, or abolish it in such manner as shall be judged most conducive to the public wheel. Now, what's more American than that? In America, we shape our own constitutional destiny. It was right there in Virginia's Declaration of Rights. And I can go on and on. I mean, it, it, it has great statements about separation of powers. It has various provisions that echo our own Bill of Rights on free speech, on religious liberty, on the right to bear arms, on the right to be free of unreasonable searches and seizures, or you know, against unreasonable, uh, cruel and unusual punishment. It's all there. Um, so it really is a deeply profound document. You should definitely check it out. But the Virginia Declaration of Rights wasn't important simply for its elegant expression of core American values at the dawn of our republic. It was also of great practical importance. In short, it came first. It was the first state bill of rights um, laying out the people's rights against their government. And it was a sensation. 
It was reprinted in newspapers in Virginia and Pennsylvania first, and then it expanded to the rest of the colonies and even around the globe through broadsides, newspapers, pamphlets. It would influence the state bills of rights of several other states, including our own Pennsylvania. In fact, in some, in some cases, other states simply copied parts of the Virginia Declaration of Rights word for word, basically stealing from George Mason. As Mason himself explained later, the Declaration had been, quote, closely imitated by all the other states. In short, its influence was profound. Well, you don't believe me, just ask Samuel Adams, the great revolutionary. At the time of its adoption, Adams called the Virginia Declaration, quote, a feast to our little circle. I love that. <laughs> Quite the constitutional legacy, American founder indeed. So that's George Mason the man, George Mason the founder. Let's end by talking about George Mason the dissenter. For those of us here at the National Constitution Center, this is probably the part of George Mason's story that's most familiar. If you leave Kirby Auditorium after this program and walk over to Founders Hall, uh, Signers Hall, uh, you'll see Mason off to the side in the back of the room, one of the three delegates who refused to sign the Constitution. Of course, dissent has played a key role throughout American history. Abolitionists speaking out against slavery, the suffragists calling for the right to vote for women, the civil rights movement speaking out against Jim Crow, and in many cases, dissent is what has propelled our nation and our Constitution forward. Mason's decision to speak out against the Constitution is a key part of this important American tradition. In fact, it's a useful reminder of both dissent's importance, but also its personal costs for the speaker. Mason was an active participant at the Constitutional Convention and in the ratification debates that followed. Shortly after the convention began, he wrote the following to his son, explaining the profound challenges facing the delegates. It is easy to foresee that there will be much difficulty in organizing a government upon this great scale and at the same time reserving to the state legislatures a sufficient portion of power for promoting and securing the prosperity and happiness of their respective citizens. Yet with a proper degree of coolness, liberality, and candor, very rare commodities, by the by, I doubt not but that it may be affected. And so here is Mason at this moment of the America's founding already wrestling with some of the really greatest issues that we continue to wrestle with today. What should be the scope of power of the federal government? How can it serve us? What should be the relationship between the federal government and the states? How do we honor all of those competing values? During the convention itself, Mason gave more than 100 speeches on the convention floor, shaping the debate on several key issues, including representation, congressional power, the powers of the president, and the slave trade. True to his distaste for small talk and artifice, he also had some choice words for our beloved city of Philadelphia. Quote, I begin to grow heartily tired of the etiquette and nonsense so fashionable in this city. However, Mason's key moment came on September 12, 1787, the day that the Committee of Style reported a new draft of the Constitution to the convention. Mason urged the delegates to follow Virginia's example and preface the U.S. Constitution with a Bill of Rights. He argued that this edition would, quote, give great quiet to the people and said that using state constitutions as his guide, he might be able to prepare a federal Bill of Rights in, quote, a few hours. Mason didn't lack for confidence, also for good reason. Unfortunately, with the delegates eager to close the convention, they rejected Mason's plea with James Madison, James Wilson, and other leading framers saying that such an addition was unnecessary. In turn, Mason refused to support the Constitution. As Madison described it, quote, Colonel Mason left Philadelphia in an exceeding ill humor indeed. But Mason wasn't done. Following the convention, he then led the crusade against the Constitution or released the Constitution as unamended. And in the weeks and months ahead, many state conventions, at least in part, followed Mason's lead, passing resolutions calling for a federal Bill of Rights, even as they voted to ratify, uh, voted, voted to ratify the new Constitution. It's worth noting that Mason's opposition to the Constitution took a personal toll on him. Many of his closest friends and former associates supported the Constitution, most notably his neighbor, George Washington. More generally, some of the public commentary during the ratification fight even questioned whether Mason was losing his intellectual fastball. For instance, Rutland recounts this terrific exchange from Mason's campaign for a seat on the, at the Virginia Ratifying Convention. Mason's opponent declared it, quote, well known to the public that the colonel's mind was failing. Mason tartly replied, quote, sir, when yours fails, nobody will ever discover it. <laughs> Isn't that great? I just, just love that. So Virginia and the nation would ultimately vote to ratify the Constitution. However, while Mason lost this specific political battle, he may have ultimately won the larger constitutional war as the Federalists, including James Madison, ultimately agreed to draft a federal Bill of Rights in America's first Congress. 
of the new Bill of Rights, Mason said, quote, I have received much satisfaction from the amendments to the federal constitution which have lately passed. In the end, it was Mason's role as dissenter that helped spur this critical constitutional change. As he explained his reasoning at the time, quote, the security of our liberty and happiness is the object we ought to have in view in wishing to establish the Union. If instead of securing these, we endanger them, the name of the Union will be but a trivial consolation. So the next time you think about the Bill of Rights or visit it right here in the National Constitution Center right down the hallway, please do think about our friend, the reluctant statesman, George Mason. And with that, I'll turn the program over to Scott Stroh, our wonderful panelist. Thank you so much for your attention and for coming to this symposium. Wasn't that a fabulous presentation from Tom? Thank you very much. I have the great privilege of moderating our first panel on George Mason and America's founding, Mason's constitutional legacy. We are very fortunate today to have some fabulous historians uh, and community leaders with us today. First, working down from my left, Fergus Bordwich. Then we have Julie Silverbrook from the Constitutional Sources Project and historian David O. Stewart. And just to get us started, um, again, thank you for being here. Would just like to pose a topic for y'all to comment on, and that would be, how did George Mason's ideas about government and citizenship and rights as reflected in the Declaration of Rights that we just learned even more about, shape and influence his work at the convention here in Philadelphia in 1787? wants to start? Uh, I, I'm afraid I'm not going to cue the party line entirely on this um, because the Declaration of Rights is of course about individual rights principally and the Constitutional Convention did almost nothing about individual rights. There are a couple of provisions in the Constitution, a right to jury trial in a criminal case, ex post facto laws that are about individual rights, but mostly they're not there. And the convention didn't deal with them until that day in September when Mason stands up and says we should have a Bill of Rights. And most of the delegates there thought that was a stalling tactic, that he was just unhappy with the Constitution for other reasons because of he disliked the Senate, he disliked the rules on commerce laws. And that's really why it got shouted down. It, it got no support except from his friend Elbridge Gerry. So I think the connection between the Declaration of Rights and the Convention is pretty attenuated. His stature was significant because of the Declaration of Rights and he was an important delegate for the first couple of months of the Convention until he fell into his own dissatisfaction and then he, he became a progressively more marginal figure. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. Uh, Mason is quite influential and we'll talk about this more in the second question uh, during the, the first part um, of the convention and really it's after the Committee of Detail uh, puts together a draft constitution in August that he starts to uh, become dissatisfied with certain aspects um, of the constitution. But I think you can trace it, not necessarily to his work specifically with the Declaration of Rights, but his thinking um, during the revolutionary period. Um, and, and you see uh, his interest in uh, rotation in office or what we would call elections today. That traces back to uh, you know, when he was involved with uh, the Fairfax County Volunteers, a small militia unit uh, in Virginia that he was in charge of uh, during the revolution. He says uh, the militia leaders should uh, be elected on an annual basis. Um, and this interest in uh, you know, um, annual elections, that carries through into uh, the Constitutional Convention, although he gives a little bit um, on that and, and violates that Republican maxim where annual elections end, tyranny begins, 
being okay with the House being elected uh, every two years because he recognizes the practical difficulties uh, of larger states uh, and more distant states, uh, you know, counting the, the, the votes and, and certifying them and getting their delegates uh, to, to Congress. And so those are, are thoughts that you can trace back uh, to the revolutionary period. Um, another really important point, and, and I think this is actually uh, a, a major sticking point for him in the Constitutional Convention, is this idea that the popularly elected House, uh, both at the state level and at the federal level, ought to be the ones making decisions about money bills. So in the federal constitution, this is what we call the origination clause, that money bills originate in the House. Uh, this is very important to Mason, and it's traced back uh, to the discussions on the Virginia Declaration of Rights and uh, the Virginia Constitution. So I, I do, I guess, I would agree, I disagree slightly in the, in the sense that I, I do think you can trace some of his thoughts back uh, from you know, 1776 and then forward into some of the sticking points for him um, in the Constitutional uh, Convention. Yeah, uh, uh, as, as Tom suggested in, in, in his keynote, uh, I mean, his influence, the influence of the uh, Declaration of Rights after the convention is towering, it's massive, it spreads uh, his, his, his uh, writing on, on uh, uh, civil rights and, and uh, Bill of Rights extends throughout the, the states. I don't want to step on the next panel because I know it's going to focus much more on that. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I agree with David, of course, that at the convention, I don't think it, it makes uh, a, great impact, a great impact, and frankly, it's part, uh, much of the reason why he feels so marginal, marginalized, and in fact, is marginalized by the end. Uh, but I think it's quite remarkable how uh, he emerges from Gunston Hall after, after uh, years and years and years of, of, of uh, rejecting uh, uh, election to one body after another, goes to Philadelphia, if I'm, unless I'm mistaken, it's his uh, only extended trip out, outside uh, the Potomac Valley. Uh, and not, not, only, not only participates, but participates vigorously, creatively, effectively. He, he arrives with considerable stature and increases it until he, he uh, kind of defects from the federal, Federalist agenda. And, uh, uh, but, it's hard to distinguish him, really, say, from Madison, uh, in the course of the, with whom he works very closely in the course of the, con uh, the convention, and uh, the the disappointment of of uh, uh, Madison and others with his with his defection at the end of the convention is is palpable. I wish I could quote some of the remarks that are made, but they aren't very kind. Thank you, and let's explore a little further as you have articulated this this process by which he is marginalized. As we've, as we've heard and as we've introduced, he goes with the Virginia delegation um, as one body, and over the course of that summer, this process, as you have said, of marginal, marginalization occurs. So in light of that, um, let's explore that a little bit further in terms of his role um, as a delegate there and this process um, that he went through from arriving in May up through September. Everybody turns to me, so I'll start. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I think he's a very important figure in the great, what has been called the Great Compromise. Uh, the big fight at the convention, much to Madison's shock, was over representation, uh, whether there should be proportional representation in the houses of Congress or whether it should be one state, one vote. It had always been one state, one vote in Continental Congress, in the Confederation Congress. Um, and to get away from that, which was very important to Madison and Wilson and some of the others, uh, they were demanding proportion, uh, proportional representation in both houses. The small states became terribly terrified by this. And uh, Mason was conciliatory on that. Um, you know, we might have skipped over. He actually also was an important draftsman for the first Virginia Constitution. And I think you can draw some important ties from that document to what he did at the convention. And I think on this issue, the Virginia Constitution at the time gave two delegates to each county, regardless of the size and population of the county. So he was comfortable with that sort of notion that the jurisdiction got represented. And so he helped bring about the compromise. 
uh, they had discovered with the Virginia Constitution that they failed to include an amendment process, which he recognized as a mistake. And he argued very strongly for a, insisting on an amendment process in the Constitution. And he, one of the great speeches he gave says, the one thing we may sure, be sure of here is that we will do some things wrong and that will need to be fixed. Um, of course, true. And he, these are important things that made him the center. Of course, he was also part of the Virginia cabal that produced the Virginia plan that was the initial framework for the conversation. So this was all his, his productive period, and I think you can draw those, those lines. And it was his first moment on the big stage, as Fergus was talking about. He, this is the time he really steps out on a national stage. Until then, he's a regional figure. Even people in Virginia haven't seen that much of him because he stays uh, in Fairfax County much of the time. And, uh, it, and he does make an extra impression because of that. It's worth noting, uh, you know, Mason was a sufferer of, of gout and was quite sickly, uh, although, you know, it's reported that he was in the be some of the best health um, of his life in, in Philadelphia, um, you know, despite being one of the elder statesmen. I think mm -hmm. he was about 62, um, and so that, that put him in sort of the older, uh, you know, category at the, at the convention. Um, and, uh, you know, he comes in with the Virginia delegation and he, it's important to know he wins almost as many issues as he loses. It's just that he loses some really pivotal issues toward the end, which is why he decides not to sign the Constitution ultimately. And we'll talk about this a little later with his relationships, but, you know, people have postulated that in the 1780s, it's his relationship with Washington that sort of moves him towards sort of a more nationalist perspective. Um, and he, so he goes into the Constitutional Convention ready to give more powers uh, to the federal government. And, you know, he's a, a big, uh, plays a big role uh, in uh, the, the great uh, compromise. And, and again, it's, as I mentioned before, it's after that August draft and then through September that things start to unravel for him. Um, the origination clause issue, which I already mentioned, uh, that's something that is really important to him. Um, and uh, again, you know, comes from his time in, in drafting the Virginia Constitution and Declaration of Rights. Um, He's concerned about the powers that were given to the Senate. He becomes concerned uh, that this, we're essentially creating a system where the Senate's going to become a de facto aristocracy. Um, he uh, is concerned about a unitary executive. Uh, he thinks we ought to have uh, a plural executive. He proposed a three-person um, executive. And then he said, OK, well, if we're going to have a unitary executive, then there at least ought to be a council that advises uh, the, the president, and he loses. Uh, on that, and you see these are things that come up in his objections, which he publishes um, after the Constitutional Convention. These are major sticking points for him. Uh, toward the end of the convention, the lack of a Bill of Rights becomes an issue. Um, and then another concern, and this is something that he shared in common with Edmund Randolph, which is another one of the delegates who doesn't sign the Constitution, uh, is he thinks that uh, the states ought to be able to propose amendments that would be submitted to a second convention. Um, and that's shot down. And Mason, uh, in a speech, says, you know, uh, you know essentially it's, it's wrong to give this to the states and give them just an up or down vote. You know, they ought to have, um, you know, some say uh, over the, the contours of the Constitution. And there might be a political reason for that, which is he's hoping that his views prevail, uh, you know, through that um, amendment process. Because, again, he, he loses some pretty pivotal issues toward that end of the convention, and ultimately that's why he doesn't sign. Well, a, a couple of things about Mason stand out for me in, the, in this context. One is that, like Madison, he's a natural intellectual, a really serious thinker, uh, self, remarkably self-educated. Madison went to Princeton, of course, uh, and is able to sway his peers uh, by the power of his intellect, the power of his analysis, a power of personality to a degree. He's not a brilliant orator, but, but sufficiently serviceable that, that, it, that it adds to his persuasiveness. Uh, again, in contrast to Madison, who um, <laughs> has this whispery voice that people can barely hear, uh, that doesn't seem to be Mason's problem. He is easily heard. Um, <laughs> 
Uh, on the other hand, I'm going to contrast him again to Madison in a way. Uh, Madison had a remarkable political instinct, brilliant, brilliant political instinct. Uh, Madison lost a lot of battles uh, him, as well, even though he, in his own way, was profoundly persuasive. But Madison uh, uh, could see far enough ahead that, uh, strategically, that if he lost a battle, if he could get himself on the committee that was writing the legislation or whatever the document was, uh, he could continue to influence it, which he, he did, of course, with the uh, uh, Bill of Rights uh, later on. And I don't think that uh, Mason had that foresight or that same kind of political instinct. Uh, and he went away bitter and unhappy and mad uh, at the end of the Constitutional Convention, rather than thinking, well, what can I do now, next, in this next stage, to, to move men or move... move move the uh, political machine more in my direction. He thinks about it, but he's not very skilled at doing it. Thank you. One of the most interesting things to me as I've learned more about George Mason are these relationships. Um, he exists in this interesting uh, time between different generations and um, demographics of this founding period. He's older than Washington. Um, as we've heard from Tom, he's very much looked up to uh, by younger uh, activists as an intellectual force. And then as time goes on, even up to the end of his life, he, he is sought out by folks like James Monroe for advice and guidance as Monroe enters into the political arena as a young senator. Um, I would welcome your thoughts on these relationships, uh, how he bridged these two time periods, um, and perhaps who he was most closely aligned with and who perhaps some of his greatest adversaries were? Uh, well, well, as, as uh, I think David, or perhaps you pointed out a bit earlier, um, at one point he had a great deal in common, obviously, with George Washington and his next door neighbor down the road. And uh, Washington is a bit younger, not radically younger. I think there's an eight year difference is there in their ages. Uh, but they, they run similar, similar factories, so to speak, similar plantations. Um, both major landowners, major slave owners, and so forth. Washington clearly looks up to, to Mason as, as an intellectual. Washington is it's well known, uh, was very, was painfully, uh, painfully felt his, his shortcomings uh, uh, in, in the intellectual realm, even though uh, he was, uh, I've written about Washington in a couple of books, and the more I, the more I think about him, the more I'm impressed with his thinking. Uh, put that on the side for the moment. Washington clearly looked up to, 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 to Mason and, and says so. Uh, uh, until, uh, Mason, Mason breaks with the Federalists. George Washington, um, as, as cautious as he sometimes is in expressing himself, is, is, is deeply rooted in the Federalist vision, as, as is Madison. And uh, Washington is tremendously disappointed uh, with him. And indeed, I, I, I read a letter not, not long ago um, uh, from Washington to one of the others of, the, of that group. Uh, disparaging, uh, well, I shouldn't say disparaging, but at least expressing terrible, terrible disappointment in, in, in Mason and not grasping the urgency of, of, of ratification of the Constitution. Um, Madison, Jefferson, the younger men also clearly look up to him. Madison uh, identifies with him as a, as a fellow intellectual, uh, and I think Jefferson as well. Jefferson en route to the first Congress, uh, a little bit later than the period we're talking about here, uh, writes a lovely letter, lovely letter to um, uh, Mason expressing his uh, tremendous disappointment at, at, at being unable to have a sort of a sleepover at Gunston Hall uh, uh, because, of, because of the weather. Indeed, indeed uh, Jefferson traveling from, from uh, Virginia to New York, uh, he's bogged down in the mud, there's a snowstorm, and he, he can't even get out of, Al out of Alexandria in his own carriage. And says, I'm sorry, George, so to speak, uh, I can't make it. 
but, but clearly, uh, Jefferson uh, identifies, certainly as an ally in, in the anti, in, in broadly speaking, in, in, in Mason's anti-federalism, although Jefferson commits himself, as Madison would, to, to making what Patrick Henry called the crazy machine of government, uh, exact quote, uh, crazy machine of government work. Uh, uh, Mason is more equivocal. I would just add to that that um, I, I think Washington is really a pivotal figure in, in Mason's life. If you, you trace this back to the revolutionary period, it's uh, Washington and his great respect for Mason's intellect. He brings uh, Mason into a small committee that drafts the Fairfax, Fairfax Resolves, uh, which is really uh, Mason's first uh, big moment on, on uh, the stage uh, in the revolutionary period. I think Washington is pivotal in um, helping Mason, as I mentioned earlier, move in a more nationalist uh, direction in the 1780s. And so I, I really uh, think that even though Washington, as sort of a younger man and, and a person who uh, did feel a little bit of an inferiority complex about his lack of formal education, really looked up to Mason's intellect, he also, because of that, um, helped to bring the more reluctant Mason along um, for some really important moments um, in American history. And I, I really see that relationship um, as a very important one, and I hope one uh, that is, is certainly worthy of further explore, exploration. And I would love to see you know, maybe even a book um, about Mason and Washington. I mean, one of the unfortunate things about Mason as a forgotten founder is just the, the lack of scholarship uh, on Mason and his life and his relationship uh, with uh, other uh, key figures in the period. Um, so I, I hope this is this and the efforts of Gunston Hall and the National Constitution Center uh, help to spur scholars to explore this uh, in greater depth because I think it's really fascinating and it's important. Uh, just following on that, there, there is an interesting article by a fellow named Peter Henricus, who's a scholar of this era about the Mason-Washington relationship, and he concludes that actually Mason was more solicitous of Washington than Washington was of Mason. And, and the argument is essentially based on uh, documentary materials, but you can also see it in, take the Fairfax Resolves, for example, which I think are a terribly important moment in, in our history. Uh, Mason writes them. Uh, the Fairfax meeting adopts them, and then Mason doesn't go to Richmond or Williamsburg, wherever the next meeting is, but Washington goes down there with them and he presents the Fairfax Resolves and he gets all the credit, basically, in front of the rest of the Virginians and that vaults him into becoming the delegate to the Continental Congress. Um, and I think maybe Mason was feeling sick, I don't know. Maybe he just didn't care to take the bow, um, but it was a great opportunity for Washington and he made the most of it. I think a lot of Mason's legacy does come through his relationships, and I would focus on the Anti-Federalists because Jefferson sort of makes it respectable to be, if not a dissenter, at least a skeptic about the Constitution and about certainly the way Hamilton and Washington are building the government. And he very much pays court to Mason and attributes to Mason his inspiration for these ideas, which then, of course, are also adopted by Madison and Monroe. So, you know, Mason dies so soon after the new government starts, it, it's hard, to, and he declines to go into it. Um, but it's, so it's hard to show him influencing it, but I think you can see those relationships as the way his influence really did bite. Great, and thinking about Washington and Mason's relationship, one of my favorite letters is one that Washington actually wrote when he was actively um, serving as general, in which he writes to George Mason, who is home at Gunston Hall, not participating in any elected body at the time, basically imploring Mason, saying, where are the men of intellectual ability and influence? Why aren't they serving uh, in the Continental Congress or in the state's elected bodies? Um, why aren't they uh, um, participating in this process. We have needs, where are they? It's a fascinating window into, into that relationship. And we have heard um, a little bit how, in fact, Mason's longest journey from his home at Gunston Hall was coming to Philadelphia. And 
Um, I think the very um, accurate illustration of this as an opportunity for him on the national stage, and we know that uh, Mr. Gary from Massachusetts was one of the others who didn't sign. Do you all, um, can you share a sense of these relationships beyond colleagues in Virginia um, and what if any interactions were particularly pivotal with delegates from other areas within uh, the young United States? I think you see in the convention itself, um, Gary agrees, and I think it might have actually been Gary's motion for the Bill of Rights and then Mason seconds. Um, and so, you know, obviously they're sharing a similar thought process at, at this point in the convention about the lack of a Bill of Rights. Same thing with uh, Edmund Randolph. Uh, it's his idea that there be amendments uh, proposed to a second convention. He moves Mason seconds. Um, so I think toward the end of the, of the convention, uh, there must be some camaraderie amongst these dissenters, or at least they're, they're thinking along the same lines. Um, and that goes through, uh, you know, through the debates over uh, ratification. Yeah, um, Elbridge Gerry, um, uh, I take your point though, I'm not sure camaraderie is a word <laughs> maybe, that leaps yeah, to maybe. mind with respect to uh, either Mason fair, or, fair enough, or, fair or enough. Gary, but <laughs> no, in, in principle, yeah. Right, right, they agreed in that regard. Um, Elbridge Gerry, of course, is, is one of another, so to speak, forgotten founder and who bequeathed to us, as most people perhaps know, the term gerrymandering, it should be gerrymandering, but uh, <laughs> We say gerrymandering. It comes from a later period when he was governor of uh, Massachusetts. But uh, uh, they uh, were they, along with Randolph, were the three who didn't sign. And uh, Gary had a knack, a sort of Nixonian knack, for just irritating just about everybody who dealt with him. <laughs> uh, uh, and. Uh, which some people thought Mason had as well. Not that I'm saying that. Uh, I wasn't there, but uh, 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 Gary was sort of an unlikely ally, except that they were equally uh, upset by, by, the, by the Constitution. Though Gary, later on, like Madison, throws himself in trying to make the machine work. Uh, he's extremely active um, in the following decade. Uh, uh, and is willing to compromise where, where Mason would not. Um, but uh, uh, Gary was a New England mercantilist, an extremely rich uh, uh, a commercial man from, from Boston, and indeed represented exactly the class that Mason, uh, well, uh, disliked at least in principle, as uh, and, uh, Mason's, Mason's adamancy uh, against uh, the, the Senate's uh, power over navigation legislation was directed specifically at New England, uh, uh, the New England mer mercantile class. So it's, a, it's an alliance of, of convenience rather than, I, I think, a, a buddy system. Uh, uh, and I did want to add one word about Washington as well. Uh, since um, Washington, I mean, you, you kind of think these two guys are friends. They're neighbors, they have a lot in common, and so on. Washington really had no friends. He had no friends. He had colleagues, he had people he admired, the world admired him, uh, but uh, he had just about no intimates. He had people who were transactionally close to him. Uh, so it's not surprising that there would be a distance uh, between him and, and, and Mason even though it, it became a distance based, based on, on, on a different difference of opinion uh, and so on. But it's, it's not out of character for Washington with respect to a lot of people. If it's okay, just make a quick note on navigation laws because we didn't talk about yeah. that. In, and and it, it's really important because a lot of the delegates go in with parochial concerns and Mason is, is not exempt from that. And he is really concerned um, about giving the Senate power over navigation laws because the uh, northern and middle states outnumber the southern states. And there's a real concern. He wanted, what he wanted was a supermajority requirement. He wanted two-thirds, which would protect the South from essentially 
you know, becoming captive customers of the North. And that's something that he's really concerned about. And it really is a major sticking point for him um, over the Constitution. So I just wanted to, to really fast spotlight that um, in, in terms of his thinking during the convention, because it's important and we, we didn't touch on it in, in the previous question. And then I'll, I'll let you go ahead and talk more about relationships. Yeah, I was just going to say that I do think at the convention, it mattered who was in the room. And it just so happened that the two leaders of the sort of dissenters at that point, and if there were people who hated the Constitution and left. The New York delegates left, Luther Martin of Maryland left, they just couldn't stand it. Um, but the ones who stayed were principally uh, Gary and Mason, and they were not cuddly. And, you know, Edmund Randolph said of, of Mason, uh, he was sometimes sarcastic, though not wantonly so. So that sets the bar reasonably low. I've, I'm <laughs> aiming for not being wantonly sarcastic in my pr private life. Um, and they did, in fact, in the final weeks of the convention, after the first draft comes out of the Committee of Detail, they had evening meetings with each other, and they tried to bring in other people to oppose the Constitution with them. Uh, the Connecticut delegates met with them, some Georgia delegates met with them, and they had no success. Now, some of this has to do with their views, of course. Some may have had to do with personalities. Some may have had to do with, at some level, they were on the, you know, I'm just going to say it out loud, that they were on the wrong side of history. You know, Alexander Hamilton hates the Constitution. But he's smart enough to stand up at the final day and say, no man's ideas about this, the future government are as different from this Constitution as mine, but I will support it because he knows that's where it's going, Washington's behind, that it's going to happen. And I think that may come back to Fergus's earlier point about a strategic sense. Mason was so hung up on what he didn't like, he did a little bit lose track of the big picture. You make a great point, David, a very interesting one about the fact that uh, some of the delegates simply left. And as we've heard, um, Mason clearly was not enjoying the accommodations in Philadelphia to the extent that some of us are certainly today, um, and clearly had a great love for Gunston Hall. So I would just uh, pose the question, and we'll talk more about dissent broadly in the next panel, but why do you think he made the decision to stay when he could have left? Well, he makes a wonderful speech when they're having the argument over the Great Compromise that uh, he will not leave Philadelphia. He will leave his bones in Philadelphia before he will leave without having a constitution. Um, and seven weeks later, he makes a second speech where he says, "I would sooner cut off my right arm than sign this constitution," <laughs> which I think, for his fellow delegates, held out the prospect of an exceedingly long deliberative process. <laughs> um, and I think that really. His commitment to the process kept him here, even though he was a guy who loved to be home and would have preferred not to be here. And that counts for a great deal. And, and I give him all the credit in the world for it. Um, he did get kind of cranky at the end of the convention. Um, Madison writes a not very charitable letter about it, basically says, well, you know, he's old. For those of us who are older than 62, that's a little annoying. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, you know, it, it, I think it was per perceived that way, but he did stick it out. I always hesitate to, to psychoanalyze uh, the founding because as a, as a, a oh, go ahead. as a lawyer, I'm not <laughs> trained as a psychologist, but you know, when you look at Mason's role with the Virginia Declaration of Rights and the Virginia Constitution, he's really the central figure, right? He drafts it, and then that's the committee's working draft. I think part of his difficulty at the Constitutional Convention is, you know, because he's part of the Virginia delegation in the first part, he's really very influential, and so he's kind of maybe okay with, e and he loses on some things in the in the first half of the convention. But again, it doesn't fall apart until the second half, and really the end of the convention for him. So I, I do wonder if some of his dissatisfaction comes from that lack of control. Even some of the changes made to the Virginia Declaration of Rights and the Virginia Constitution, he had influence over the changes that were being made toward the end of the convention. I mean, he really is reduced to, you know, uh, arguing over trivia, and that must be something very, very difficult for a person who, you know, their their big actions prior to that, they had a significant amount of control 
uh, over over the outcome. So I just I imagine on a on a personal level and on a professional level as well that this was very difficult uh, for for Mason, and it's why he's so vocal uh, in his objections. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I think that th th there's much to that. Uh, Oliver Ellsworth of uh, uh, Connecticut, uh, a luminary in, in, in his own right, and another more or less forgotten founder, by the way, who deserves more attention, is one of the uh, delegates who, unless I'm mistaken, uh, uh, Mason is trying to court. Is he not? Yes. And uh, Ellsworth, Ellsworth, toward the end of the convention, uh, writes in some context of uh, Mr. Mason's madness. Uh, what is he doing? You know, um, and yeah, one can't help be st be struck by the extreme rigidity of of, of Mason at 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 the end, and of course uh, during the during the ratification process, that rigidity becomes even even more pronounced. And uh, yeah, I mean, we can recognize him as a great dissenter, one of the great dissenters in American history, and his dissent on, on uh, uh, the Bill of Rights pays off in the end. I mean, it really does pay off, uh, uh, even though he isn't so much part of the payoff himself. Um, but at the same time, you can't separate that, I think, from his, this, this kind of narrowness, and I, I don't want to say belittle it by saying crankiness, uh, by, by, by uh, once he's got his teeth into these things he doesn't like, he just can't let go. And I believe Madison, unless I'm mistaken, comments on that very thing, uh, that these things are all fixable. What's the big deal? Madison, of course, didn't want initially uh, uh, a Bill of Rights at all. He didn't want to tamper with this, with this rather fragile ship of state about to set sail. Um, but, but uh, yeah, I, I think here's a man who lives in a, what, what, at Gunston Hall, in, in considerable isolation. He corresponds uh, with, with other, other, other uh, men whom he, of, his, of his, his larger intellectual circle. But in great isolation, the very fact that he could come to Philadelphia, which in that, at that time is a Quaker-dominated city, and absolutely nobody but George Mason Th thinks that it's actually too, 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 uh, uh, um, people are too preoccupied with, 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 with society and so on. And when, when li much later, members of the first Congress leave New York for Philadelphia, they're all, they're all, oh my God, the Quakers, you know. <laughs> <laughs> boring, what a boring city, you know. No fun in Philadelphia. <laughs> So I, I'm so, 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 so struck by that, that, that comment on, on uh, Mason's part. It just tells me where he's coming from. The comments you all have shared about you know, this, his, his participating in this process is interesting as well, because I think it also, in some ways, harkens back to one of my other favorite letters that he wrote back in 1776, when, if you remember the fact that he arrived in Williamsburg for the Virginia Convention in mid May, and the Declaration of Rights was adopted in mid-June, so you've got less than a month in which all of this happens, yet three weeks in or so, he writes a fabulous letter to his good friend Richard Henry Lee in which he's complaining about the slow pace of the proceedings and his opinion that surely this, this body of representatives can come to some conclusion and ratify this wonderful thing he's written in less time than it's taking them to get around to doing it. So some of that harkens forward to, to some of his expressions in Philadelphia. And I should also say that some of the great folks from the Constitution Center are collecting questions. I don't know if we have any yet. We've got plenty more we can talk about, but if there are questions from the audience, I know we would very much like to answer those as well. And if others of you have questions, please feel free to pass them along. Um, so as Tom shared, one of the, one of the topics that um, Mason actively took a role in discussing at the convention was the slave trade. And we have a question here about Mason's ideas or thoughts about slavery as a slave owner um, in the context of uh, his participation in the Constitutional Convention and his expressions about the slave trade. I would welcome your thoughts on on that interesting aspect of Mason's ideology. Well, uh, yeah, very, very interesting subject with respect to Mason. 
In short, I think Mason is a prog- product of his, of, his, of his particular place, class, and time, which is to say, I, uh, uh, clearly he expresses uh, uh, hostility to slavery in principle. Uh, it's very different, say, say, attacking or criticizing the slave trade and criticizing slavery. Now, Mason, in a sense, rhetorically, wants it both ways in, in, in that he cl- clearly is, is deeply, deeply uh, uh, disappointed that Congress uh, doesn't ban the slave trade outright, but, but allows it con- to continue, the international slave trade, that is. It has, says nothing whatsoever, to my knowledge, about the internal slave trade. Uh, Mason owns a great many slaves. He buys human beings. He sells human beings. Uh, uh, and I, I don't think one can let him off the hook as being a proto-abolitionist or something of the sort. He does not free slaves. He doesn't free his slaves. Uh, and it's fashionable at this, in, the, in, 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 at his, in his milieu in Virginia anyway, to disdain slavery, as Jefferson did, of course, uh, but not actually do anything about it. Um, and he's, that's not an uncommon position. Uh, the slave trade, it's also not that difficult for, for Virginians to be against the slave trade. There's a super abundance of slaves in Virginia because of the economics of the time and place. And there are too many slaves uh, and slave people. They're very costly to those who own them. Uh, nonetheless, he does deserve credit I think for at least taking a rhetorical position that, that, that we can admire uh, with, with a large asterisk. Others? You know, there's a pathology to the liberty-loving slave owners, um, which, you know, Dr. Johnson noticed from England. Um, the greatest yelps about liberty come from the drivers of slaves. Um, and, you know, Mason had the same. You know, I did a book on Madison, and, you know, it's... it's it's so disappointing, and, and they're aware of their own hypocrisy. You know, they're not stupid people. They know that they are not living up to their principles. And you know, one of Mason's speeches at the convention, um, I think, is a is a great example of the pathology because what he denounces about slavery is how it affects white people. It makes every man a tyrant. And the first time I read that, I thought, well, that's an important insight. And then the second time I read that, I thought, gee, he's really not thinking about the slaves, is he? <laughs> um, and, you know, Madison writes a letter, this is not at the convention, about how, well, the real victims of slavery are the white women who, you know, have to manage these terrible people. Well, boy, that wasn't something that made me feel better about your view of humanity. Um, And they do oppose the slave trade, and Mason does, the right-thinking Virginians do, because it's so brutal. You know, a quarter, a third of the people on the slave ships would die before they even got there. Um, There is an element of self-interest in it. They have slaves that they just as soon be able to sell. Um, And Nobody can fix the problem, and they recognize it as a problem. They, it's a financial issue, very important one to all of these men, uh, and they, they, they all come up short, and we have to just accept that. Sure. Yeah, I just want to add, um, over, during the debates over the Virginia Declaration of Rights, which you know, of course has the famous line that all men are born equally free and independent, it's raised during these debates, well, how can we have this language and have slaves? I mean, is this going to bring about the abolition of slavery? And it's an it's actual concern um, of, of people who are debating that document. Is that uh, either inviting the abolition of slavery or is it inviting uh, a rebellion um, of slaves against slave owners? So, I mean, it's certainly something uh, that, uh, you know, the slave-owning class that's professing, you know, this language of, of liberty, they're they're aware of and they're and they're grappling with, and uh, unfortunately, it's not something that gets resolved. Um, and a big part of that is because of their economic uh, interests. Well, but they amended that clause. Right. They added in the phrase "in the state of society." Right. 
which they thought meant to exclude slaves. Right. So, the, you know, <laughs> they so, knew what think, they were doing. Yeah, and I think it's, I think this is a really important point, though, um, because as we read these, you know, liberty-loving documents and we explore these uh, great men, you know, we, we have to take into account this hypocrisy. Um, that doesn't, I don't think it means that we can't celebrate uh, their, their achievements and the amazing things that they've did to, you know, for the cause of freedom and equality, but we do have to remember that they were only talking about a very select class of people when they were, re when they were writing these documents. And they were leaving out a lot of people, not just slaves, uh, but women were not a part of this, uh, and they're really thinking primarily about white landowning men. Um, and I think that's a really important point when you're studying history to remember that. Well, just quickly, please. Mason wanted a property qualification yeah. on all voters in federal elections. So uh, it was a narrow group, he thought, was, were, should be trusted. And lucky he's a part of that group, right? As it happens. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all have some great questions, thank you. There's no way we'll get to all of these in the next seven minutes. Uh, but we have a wonderful question here, I think, that um, in some ways brings us back around full circle. We've heard about the Declaration of Rights, we've heard about Mason as a delegate at the Constitutional Convention, uh, and as uh, Tom articulated so eloquently, um, Mason was one as a child and a young man who had access to books but didn't attend school. So we have a question here about, uh, in the broader context of what he wrote about in the Declaration and his continuing participation in the Constitutional Convention, what were the different philosophers or influences that you all can identify that were perhaps the greatest on Mason as he was evolving in his thinking and assuming a larger role uh, on both a, a local stage in Virginia and a national stage here in Philadelphia? Well, I'm going to finesse that question slightly. Please. <laughs> I do think you can find a lot of John Locke in what he writes, uh, certainly in the Declaration of Rights. Um, but I think it's very important to see him and his, and his contemporaries as, I think Julie was making the point that this all happened with, you know, he writes all these wonderful documents in, in a month in, in uh, the Virginia Constitution and the Declaration of Rights. They had been arguing about these issues, talking about them, thinking about them for 10 years from the beginning, Stamp Act crisis up until then, and then for another 12 years until the Constitutional Convention. This was a Constitution writing generation. These were people who, over dinner, argued about the best structure of the executive and the relations between the executive and the legislature. You know, we tell, you know, we tell each other about the insults that we just heard about that happened in the campaign trail. So it was a much more serious conversation. They had a lot fewer books, they read them a lot more carefully, and they talked about them. And that gave a depth to what they brought to these issues. Um, but as to his particular library, I'm about out. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know the particulars of, of his, his library either. That actually might be something that you and your colleagues can, can speak to, but um, the, the period in which Mason is writing the Virginia Declaration and the Virginia Constitution uh, is probably the single greatest period of Constitution writing in, in world history. All of the colonies write constitutions during this time, uh, and they're basing their experience not only on their colonial charters, uh, and the experience with the British government and their own self-government, right? But they're also drawing on uh, uh, the Magna Carta and the you know English Bill of Rights. I mean, there's a there's a whole sort of long lineage of how we arrive at the state constitutions and then the federal constitutions. And and if I could, uh, this is why my nonprofit right now is putting together for the first time in a comprehensive and freely digital way a collection tracing uh, the origins of early state constitutions because they're so important. And this is really sort of this, this laboratory of thinking um, on constitutionalism. And I don't think you can understand the federal constitution unless you understand first the colonial experience and then the state constitutional experience. It's, it's foundational. Um, and so I think you know, he's, a, he's a product of that, but he's also studying what's happening elsewhere. Yeah, I, I certainly 
agree with uh, what, what both of you said, and David, and to also reiterate what David said about how these ideas are in the air, they're percolating, they've been percolating for at least a, a generation, if not longer, through the minds of people like Mason and so on, and, and many, many who are not luminaries, who, whose names we never even think of, scattered around the, uh, the colonies, then the states. And the, these, these ideas are, are not coming out, of, um, coming out of the air, coming out of nowhere. Um, and yeah, uh, clearly Mason is, is, and his colleagues are very well versed in English constitutional history, Magna Carta, the British, uh, the English Bill of Rights, unless I'm mistaken, 1689. Um, and uh, there's an, I mean, what, what is distinctive in that generation is that there is a tremendous urgency to these questions. And indeed, it's not inapt to, to compare the, the dialogue and the thinking of, of that era with our own. And I don't mean to disparage today's politics. By the way, I think that's, I don't, I think that can be facile, you know. Uh, uh, you know, we, it's human nature to look back to a golden age when everything was, you know, they were, people were greater than ourselves. Uh, but I do think there was a tremendous urgency to creating this machine of government. Uh, Patrick Henry, as I said earlier, called it a crazy machine. Other people didn't think it was crazy. Uh, and there was a book, I believe it was by Henry Steele Commager, I may be wrong, a couple of, some decades ago, uh, interestingly titled, How Europe Imagined the Enlightenment and, and How America uh, um, Made It. In other words, transformed it insti in, into institutions. They were, these men were very well informed with, with Enlightenment thinking. Many of them, uh, uh, of course, were very, very uh, well lettered. I can't, I don't know whether Mason was fluent in French or not. Did he read in French? It's a good question. Uh, Jefferson, as we know, certainly did. So did, so did many others. Uh, and uh, certainly he was as, as knowledgeable about uh, the Roman Republic, which, which, which uh, was extremely important in the thinking of, of founders of that era. Mason was as, as knowledgeable about that as any man in the Americas, I would think. Thank you. In our last uh, two minutes, I would just invite you all to share any final thoughts about uh, Mason's role historically or his relevance or how we continue to think about Mason today? I would say, you know, go and read Mason's objections to the, to the Constitution. It's a, it's a very actually uh, easy to read, fairly succinct document. And Gunston Hall has it. Uh, we have it in our digital library. I, I think it's a very useful document for understanding some of the major objections to the Constitution. I also think that uh, in the last couple of years, there's been an increased uh, interest in uh, the anti-federalists or people who opposed ratification of the, of the Constitution. And some of that has to do with the ascendance of states' rights thinking today um, and wanting to find uh, sort of a historical route to that in the founding. And there's certainly material there um, in some of the anti-federalist uh, writings. And so I would just encourage folks that the documents are there uh, go take advantage of them. Uh, you know, at my, uh, on the Consource website, consource.org, there's plenty of anti-federalist writings, Ma Mason's writings, Madison's writings. Uh, take advantage of the fact that this is accessible to you and you can get it for free from your home computer because for most of human history, that has not been the case. Um, and so, uh, you know, take advantage of it and learn more. And I think that's gonna help us get past this forgotten uh, founder uh, discussion, uh, as I said to Tom before, I think James Wilson is the true forgotten fan, but everybody's a forgotten fan. I, you know, people argue that prior to the Broadway musical, Hamilton was a forgotten founder. There were 55 delegates, right? And so uh, and we've forgotten most of them. And we've forgotten <laughs> most of them. So you know, if this is something you're truly interested in, and if you came here in the middle of the day for this symposium, I think you are. Uh, you know, avail yourself of the resources that are out there. The National Constitution Center has great resources. Gunston Hall has great resources. Uh, you know, take time to remember all of the founders, and Mason is but one of the many important figures in this period. I think that is a fabulous way to close out our panel. Please join me in thanking our...
We now have a 10 minute break while the second panel gets ready. So please avail yourselves of the hospitality and we will reconvene in 10 minutes. Everything in here.
Are we supposed to do anything? Whoops. We will give them a minute or so. Mm -hmm. They'll notice that we're up here at some point. That's the hope. <laughs> we have to pretend we're in Madame Tussauds. That's the hope. <laughs> Oh, look, we have a timer and all that. Loving your socks. Yeah, this is a, this is a great thing to have. Yeah. yeah. Whew, it's kind of bright. Okay. Good afternoon. I want to welcome everyone back um, after our terrific first panel. Uh, my name is Mike Gerhardt and I have the honor of being the scholar in residence here at the National Constitution Center. Um, that's my night job, so to speak. During the day, I'm a law professor at University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, but I've really enjoyed the opportunity to connect with the wonderful community of Philadelphia, and particularly the National Constitution Center and all the people that um, really care about it and care about e education and knowledge about constitutional history. And we're going to go deeply into that with our second panel. Um, we are topic is dissent. Um, we've mused about the possibility of dissenting to our topic, but we thought that would be a little too ironic. Um, and so instead, we're going to launch into it um, with three terrific panelists. I'm going to introduce each briefly, and then they're going to talk uh, a little bit about our topic from their respective uh, perspectives. Um, we have Linda Monk, uh, to my far left, who is a constitutional scholar, journalist, and national award-winning author. Her books include The Words We Live By, Your Annotated Guide to the Constitution, Ordinary Americans, U.S. History Through the Eyes of Everyday People, and The Bill of Rights, A User's Guide. She also served as a visiting scholar here at the National Constitution Center in 2003. Next to her, to her right, immediate right, is Stephen Solomon, who's the Marjorie a Dean, Professor of Financial Journalism at New York University, where he teaches First Amendment law and is Associate Director of the Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute. He's also the author of Revolutionary Dissent, How the Founding Generation Created the Freedom of Speech. And to my immediate left is Ralph Young, professor of history at Temple University. He also runs a weekly discussion forum, The Dissent in America Teach-Ins, that deal with the historical background of controversial contemporary issues. He's the author of Dissent, The History of an American Idea. If you don't mind, please join me in welcoming them to the podium. So Ralph, I want to start with you, um, given your book, Dissent, The History of an American Idea, which really suggests that dissent helps define our country. Could you share with us your thoughts yeah. about our topic? <clears throat> yeah, my research and, and the book that I've written is uh, basically the thesis is that dissent is central to American history, that this country was founded by dissenters, and uh, we've been dissenting ever since. You know, in the 17th century, you had religious dissenters, notably Quakers and Puritans, coming over and settling in the colonies. Uh, by the 18th century, you had a lot of political dissent, which eventually culminates in the American Revolution, which is a pretty significant act of dissent. Uh, and then, after the Revolution, when we framed the Constitution, uh, it was inserted into the Constitution, you know, the First Amendment, the Bill of Rights, uh, and this is, I find, also very interesting because George Mason, leading, one of the leading anti-federalists, uh, was protesting against ratifying the Constitution. And his dissent against the Constitution basically enabled the Bill of Rights to be included in the Constitution. So in one way you can think of it is that the Bill of Rights itself is a product of dissent. Then, you know, so in the First Amendment is the that we have this right to dissent, and, uh, and Americans haven't shut up. <laughs> you know, you had uh, abolitionists protesting against slavery, women fighting for the right to vote, workers fighting for the right to unionize. You know, after slavery ended, you had uh, the civil rights movement, which actually even begins in the 19th century, but you know, it doesn't really uh, take off, it doesn't really get wings until you know, pretty much after the Second World War. Uh, you have, uh, and of course now we have, whether it's Black Lives Matter or anti-war movements, we have gay rights, uh, so many different things that are really uh, kind of in the headlines almost every day. Uh, every single war 
in our nation's history has had its dissenters, including the revolution, including the Civil War, and on both sides. So, you know, dissent, you know, the United States is a, a product of dissent. Uh, it existed before the United States existed. And so I always say when uh, people are complaining about somebody protesting, you know, for example, uh, you know, this Colin Kaep Kaepernick, you know, with the thing with the national anthem right now, and they think he's unpatriotic. Well, you know, my response is that he's not unpatriotic. He, you know, he obviously loves this country, and he wants this country to live up to what it put down on paper with the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. And, and that's another thing I've discovered in my research and writing of that book is that dissenters constantly are quoting from these founding documents, whether it's Susan B. Anthony when she's giving her speech, is it a crime for a US citizen to vote, when she quotes directly from the Constitution and says, you know, she's saying it says, we the people of the United States. It doesn't say we the male white citizens of the United States. It says we the people of the United States. You know, and we're forming this union to, you know, secure the blessings of liberty to our posterity. That's not our half of our posterity, it's all of our posterity. So you know, she's doing that. And Martin Luther King, uh, for example, in his last speech, uh, I'm sure many of you probably remember this at, at the time even, what a, an astonishing speech that was where it seemed like he was uh, you know, anticipating his own death the next day. And just before he gets to that part where he's talking about, I've been to the mountaintop, uh, he starts off talking about the injunctions that the city of Memphis had put on the march that they had wanted to do that week. And he said, you know, uh, if I lived in a totalitarian society like Russia or China, I wouldn't mind all these illegal injunctions. But somewhere I read of the freedom of speech. And he pauses. You know, somewhere I read of the freedom of assembly. Somewhere I read of the freedom of press. Somewhere I've read that the greatness of America is the right to protest for right. And at that point, he goes into his puration about the mountaintop. And so it seems to me that you know, dissent is one of the uh, characteristics of the United States. It's in our DNA. And I think that you know, we've had so much dis you know, dissent from the founding of this country. And here as we are at the beginning of the 21st century, I mean, one thing I think we can safely say that that tradition will continue. And, uh, it, you know, and one of the significant things I think about George Mason is his protest against ratifying the Constitution until it had that Bill of Rights in it. Thank you, Ralph. Um, Stephen, I want to turn to you because dissent is also important, of course, in your work. Uh, your book, Revolutionary Dissent, suggests, of course, dissent was important to the framers. Um, tell us a little bit more about, about that. Sure. Well, dissent in this country was uh, very difficult to win, and the fact there was no right to dissent very early on. Um, see, we were an English colony, and so we inherited from England English common law, and part of that law was seditious libel, and that criminalized dissent. If you dissented against a law or a, a, a royal governor or whoever it was, um, you could actually be cr criminally punished. And up until around 1700, uh, there were about 1,200 cases in the colonial courts in which people were brought in and they were prosecuted criminally for criticizing tax collectors or royal governors or the General Assembly and all that because of this, this law. Um, now, how did we get from there to here in terms of our, our right to dissent? Well, it, it really started in 1765 with passage of the Stamp Act, which enraged people. Um, and it started with you know, people like James Otis Jr. and uh, John Dickinson writing these uh, terrific pamphlets um, going into you know, English constitutional law, the, you know, the Magna Carta and the English Bill of Rights. And uh, these pamphlets spread throughout the colonies. But they, uh, they, they noticed that um, one, one problem with that, which was that you know, half the people were illiterate, 
and many of the people who were literate certainly weren't schooled enough to understand the, the complex arguments that they were making. So what they did in a very deliberate way was democratize protest. And they, they found a really interesting way to do that. So in, in August of 1765, just shortly before the Stamp Act uh, came into, uh, into, in, in, uh, into being, um, the, the, uh, they, they hung um, effigies from the biggest elm tree in Boston, the Sons of Liberty did. And one effigy was of the British Prime Minister, another was of the stamp distributor for Boston, and the third was the devil. So, I mean, we kind of laugh at it today, but this was serious business back in, in, in Puritan Boston. I mean, think about how this. This is for 2.0. Yeah, I mean, this is, this, this image falls on 18th century eyes, and the devil was the representation of all evil in Puritan society. So this was serious d dissent. But what it did was it brought the people out. I mean, thousands of them in colonial Boston. It was a spectacle. And that's exactly what they wanted. Uh, and throughout the day, there were as many as three or 4,000 people who came out in a town of 16,000. It'd be like 2 million people coming to uh, a demonstration in Boston. And they knew they were onto something. And so they repeated it. And so even in the, the harshness of, of the Boston winter in February of 1766, um, they, they called everybody out to the Liberty Tree again. They had called it the Liberty Tree. And they put the stamp back on trial, and they had you know, two lawyers arguing, and there, were, there was a judge and a jury. And, and after a couple hours, of course, the jury found the stamp back guilty of you know, taxation without representation and all, and all of that. And then they had conveniently built gallows. And so you know, we know what happened from there. And so this became a spectacle. And um, it, 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 it was publicized throughout the colonies, and newspapers carried stories of it, and all throughout the colonies there were liberty trees and liberty poles in imitation. Um, and they found other ways to democratize dissent, uh, things like songs. John Dickinson, who was one of the great pamphlet writers, uh, probably the greatest until Thomas Paine, um, he wrote what's called the Liberty Song. And, uh, you, 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 uh, United we stand, divided we fall, that comes from the Liberty uh, Song. And people, uh, even if they were illiterate, could um, s go to these demonstrations or in taverns and so forth and sing the song and participate in, in the debate and, and the dissent. And so by this means, this dissent spread and involved all elements of society. Very important to convince Parliament to rescind the Stamp Act, which, which they did. Of course, they passed more acts, which were um, uh, obnoxious to the colonies. But, but the, the, the dissent started to spread. Uh, it didn't end with the revolution. And in fact, um, you know, it, it continued through the founding period with, with the Constitution. And I have my handy Constitution with me. Um, it does fit in a pocket. Um, and what does it say? We, the people of the United States, do ordain and establish this Constitution of the, for the United States of America. Ordain and establish. The entire process of ordaining the Constitution came through what John Adams called the greatest debate in the history of the world up to that time. And I, I don't think he was exaggerating. He's prob it's probably still true today. But they were out in the streets. They were, they were writing essays and pamphlets. And um, they were you know, the opponents of the Constitution were, you know, burned copies of the Constitution, and that those in favor of it answered by putting the Constitution on top of a poll. And this was the whole process uh, that went through uh, this period. Um, and so when the First Amendment was, was ratified, you know, what did it mean? What, well, we had a heritage of, of dissent, um, of, of, of a self-governing people under we the people, and um, the, the inherent right of a sovereign people, a self-governing people under a Republican form of government to debate and dissent was, was, was fundamental because you couldn't have a democracy, you couldn't have a Republican form of government without the, the, the right to dissent and to elect people and, and unelect them. Uh, and that was very different from England where sovereignty was in parliament and the king could do no wrong. So a completely different form of government and it required 
dissent in order to work. Thank you, Stephen. And of course, Linda, you've also um, studied constitutional law, and dissent's important to your study of constitutional law. Uh, tell us about that. Well, sorry. And I, and, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay. But I'd um, like to point out, too, that I'm sure our fellow speakers will acknowledge is we have a tradition of dissent, but we also have a tradition of repressing dissent. And that goes back as far as the tradition of dissent. And early in our history of the First Amendment, I'd like to speak to that, of, of how dissenters were treated when the First Amendment, barely the ink was dry on it. But let me start a little bit with our patron, uh, George Mason, whom, as you've heard, was a neighbor to George Washington from our first panel. He was really the elder statesman to Washington. And uh, we give him a lot of credit for the Bill of Rights on several fronts. One is because of the Mason-Gary resolution at the Constitutional Convention that proposed that we add a Bill of Rights to the Constitution. Um, and the fiery bit of speech that he gave before George Washington as the president of the Constitutional Convention saying, I would rather cut off my right arm than sign it to the Constitution as it now stands. You just didn't talk to George Washington that way. And, uh, and as Mason himself said, he doesn't think that the general ever really forgave him for that. He paid a big price for his opposition. My state where I currently live, North Carolina, uh, took Mason to heart. Of course, it was even then known as a colony state of rabble-rousers and dissenters. Yay. Uh, <laughs> but Madison refers to them, that state, when he's coming up with his reasons for supporting the Bill of Rights or sponsoring a Bill of Rights. He says it's going to bring North Carolina into the Union. They were the only state that refused to ratify before uh, subsequent amendments. So I agree with the, the tradition of dissent, and I'd also like to talk just a little bit more about how we treated the dissenters. Uh, Mason certainly didn't fare well. Uh, he lost an important friendship to him. Um, his reasons, as was brought out in the first panel, were uh, disparaged of why did he really want a Bill of Rights? Was it really, like all the Federalists said, oh, you just don't want the Constitution to start with? Um, James Madison himself says, well, uh, I'm not sure what the reasons are, but whatever the reasons, this is his being a good politician, I'm going to do something about it. And he kept his promise. The thing that's most troubling to me, and I'd like to speak a little bit now, is that early history under the First Amendment ratified in 1791. Barely seven years has gone by, and what, what piece of legislation does Congress pass? This Alien and Sedition Act, right? And Steve's just told us a bit about this tradition of seditious libel, where, in fact, it was a crime to criticize the government. And in fact, the greater the truth, the greater the libel. Uh, the truth was no defense. And we'd like to think that, uh, that Americans started out understanding the, the problem with that. And yet, here comes the Sedition Act. And two of my favorite examples the prosecutions under the Sedition Act. One is a member of Congress himself, Matthew Lyon, from Vermont. And uh, have any of you seen that famous engraving of, well, well of course, our scholars have, and you may have seen it other. When you talk about um, civility and how things were so civil in the old days and everything, you just have to remember, here's Matthew Lyon, who is what becomes a Democratic Republican, Roger Griswold, who's a signer of the Constitution and a Federalist, he gets mad um, because Lyon has essentially used what would have been a cuspidor in the House and decides to attack him with his cane. Lyon gets the fire tongs back and forth. Guess who's the first person prosecuted under the Sedition Act? Matthew Lyon as a newspaper editor and a sitting member of Congress. One of my other stories that I enjoy is with the um, John Adams, and uh, who's, uh, Lyon is convicted, in fact, for saying that Adams advocates a ridiculous pomp and foolish grandeur. That's his big criticism of Adams under the Sedition Act. But one poor fellow in New Jersey who's um, enjoying fireworks that are being shot as Adams uh, uh, marches through town and 
one of his fellow inebriates says, oh, there goes John Adams, and they're firing fireworks at his arse. And the, the, the Wobegon convicted person says, I wish they would fire the fireworks through his arse. <laughs> and he's convicted. So uh, we can laugh today about, about the circumstances, but it was very serious. It proved very early on that our First Amendment meant nothing if you were in the political minority and all branches of government, remember we talk about separation of powers, what if they're all dominated by the same political beliefs who support a doctrine of sedition? And that's the thing we have to remember. They, the, the presidency was federalist, the Congress was federalist, and the Supreme Court itself was federalist. Our first test of the First Amendment should have been a famous Supreme Court case of 18, well, 1799. And it didn't happen. Why? Because the people knew they would lose. Think of that had been our very first Supreme Court case on the First Amendment to uphold seditious libel. And Madison and Jefferson quickly figure out, OK, we've got to come up with something else. But then what they come up with, the Vir Virginia and Kentucky resolutions, has words in it about interposition and nullification. I mean, that what really saved what we think of the First Amendment today was an election and when the minority became the majority. So that's the only um, footnote that I would add to our discussion is it's equally as important to know how we oppress dissent and the mechanisms that come out of it. And because of that, in some ways, we don't wind up with major S Supreme Court cases on the First Amendment to the 1920s and 30s. Yeah, and in fact, I want to pick up roughly where you left off, Linda, with, with Steve. Um, and if um, let me frame my question, then you can take it any direction you want. Um, so yes, we don't get a Supreme Court case in the First Amendment until the early 20th century. Um, and I think it's generally speaking a very healthy thing that the Supreme Court is not always a subject when we talk about constitutional history or constitutional law. What other actors do with regard to different parts of the Constitution is extremely important. Steve, in your book, you, you don't tell stories about the Supreme Court but instead tell stories about the founding generation's commitment to dissent apart from the Supreme Court. Uh, when, why, why, um, why is the Supreme Court not that important in the early history of, in, with respect to commitment sure. to dissent? Sure. First, I'd like to, to address something that Linda said, uh, which, is, which is all true about the Sedition Act. This was the most odious anti-speech law in American history, passed seven years after the, the First Amendment was ratified. And it's something like, I, I think, 10 or 12 um, editors and politicians went to jail, all political opponents, opponents of Adams. Um, but I think it was said before that, that dissent is in our DNA. And when you look closely at what was going on during that time, people, the opposition did not go into their storm cellars and wait for the storm to pass. And as a matter of fact, dissent actually increased because uh, what Adams did his, his big mistake, which he admitted later on, was that he made martyrs out of dissenters. And th that's always a bad idea, okay? Like, never make martyrs out of dissenters. It happened all through the colonial period when the British governors would try to you know, target dissenters. Um, so dissent flourished. Um, the number of oppos opposition newspapers during that two and a half year period that the law was in effect actually doubled. So, um, so they were, they were pushing back against Adams. And then, of course, in the, in the election of 1800, uh, they threw the rascals out. And like 20 years later, the Federalist Party disappeared. Uh, to your question about, about the Supreme Court cases, um, you know, the, originally the, the, the Bill of Rights only applied as a, a restraint against federal power. And so the, the, first, the, yeah, the, the First Amendment didn't um, restrain the states. And so, early on, the federal government really wasn't passing anti-speech laws, the, the Sedition Act aside. Um, so it wasn't until 1925 um, that, that, that um, uh, you know, suppression of speech that came from state laws could be litigated under federal constitutional law. And that's when you start to get, get cases. Ralph, I want to take you back to sort of your perspective on dissent more generally. And it might be very helpful to sort of identify the different functions that dissent has served through American history. Well, in a sense, um, well, I, what I was saying earlier, it's almost like 
the dissenters are trying to hold the government's feet to the fire. You know, we've, uh, you know, the Constitution is this contract, and you know, it says that you're going to be supporting all of our rights, and we don't even have these rights. And so people are, uh, so many marginalized people have wound up um, pushing the government to address their needs. Now, one of the things that happens with the repression of dissent, and this, of course, is especially true, like in times of of war, like in, during the Civil War when. Um, Lincoln suspends habeas corpus yeah. and all this during the uh, First World War with Wilson's you know, Sedition and Espionage Acts, and when people like uh, Eugene V. Debs being arrested and thrown in prison for making a speech condemning the war, or um, uh, people were um, uh, protesting this attempt to stifle free speech by holding demonstrations in Central Park in New York and burning copies of the Bill of Rights because the government was basically ignoring it. And people were getting arrested for that. And H. L. Mencken, one, and later on in the 20s, comments about how, what is it about democracy? Every time we feel slightly threatened, we attack the most sacred principle we have. <laughs> he said, you know, somebody getting arrested for, uh, for uh, actually reading a copy of the Bill of Rights before burning it, and imagine uh, you know, a, you know, a Christian being burnt at the stake for proclaiming the divinity of Christ, or a royalist proclaiming the divine right of kings being executed for that. Uh, so it's, you know, democracy has this tendency to go after sort of itself. But the uh, dissenters have pushed and pushed uh, to try to get things changed. Um, we remember uh, even like during uh, the Vietnam War, there were efforts to uh, stifle dissent. There were efforts uh, with the Patriot Act that, you know, very familiarly, you know, very recently. So, um, you know, there's always been, you know, dissenters are protesting against things. There's always kind of a counter push against that, attempts to stifle that dissent. Um, but, and dissenters have also been demonized in their times. And not necessarily by the government, but by their peers. I mean, for example, when Martin Luther King was assassinated, I do remember very well, that despite the fact that many of us were shattered by it, there were people in this country that were happy for that. And um, so it's kind of a, like a, a phenomenon that people in their time sometimes are really vilified and then with the passage of time, they become sort of saints of dissent, so to speak. So these are just you know, some of the thoughts that come up uh, from, from this discussion. So as our discussion today has uh, touched on several times, one of the obvious objections to the US Constitution, Linda, was um, the fact that there was no Bill of Rights. What, what would have been the argument not to include a Bill of Rights, something we take for granted today? Well, and it's interesting when you look at the constitutional history, I, I get a little bit concerned with scholars who tend to interpolate what the regions, what reasons were. Um, Madison's known for his copious notes, although some people lately have criticized those as being too um, affected by politics subsequently, but they really didn't give a lot of reasons. I mean, Mason to me is the most persuasive when he when he makes his motion for the Bill of Rights and says, I can do it in a couple of hours. Well, how does he know he can do it in a couple of hours? Because he's already done it. When we finally get our Bill of Rights, it's pretty much like Virginia's. So um, it, it is astonishing to any group I speak to uh, that the founders would have not included a Bill of Rights. And as you know better than I, Alexander Hamilton of great fame today was one of the most persuasive people saying we didn't need a Bill of Rights. For one thing, that a Bill of Rights is something that you have a sovereign with a king. Well, then how come so many states already have a Bill of Rights? Kind of let that out. I'm a Madison guy. I just have to, a Madison woman. I have to say that right up. Uh, uh, by the way, it was Alexander Hamilton's idea about the Sedition Act, too. So just remember that when you're cheering on. <laughs> I love Lin-Manuel, but Alexander Hamilton, a little iffy on that. Anyway, um, 
Alexander Hamilton said in his famous Federalist letter that you don't need it. The entire structure of the Constitution's a Bill of Rights. We're limiting government. We don't need these specific guarantees because the government has no power to do it in the first place. Then, of course, he helps get the Sedition Act. So um, if I were to interpolate, which I criticize other people for interpolating, it's been said it came up late in the convention. Most of the delegates didn't think it was a big deal. It was defeated unanimously. Virginia's own delegation votes against to add a Bill of Rights. I mean, how, how terrible is that? Um, but I think it is probably most likely they were ready to go home. It was a summer full of black flies, Philadelphia black flies, you know, closing the windows to keep secrecy, wool suits, no deodorant, no air conditioning. Maybe they really were sick of each other, but nobody said it. I, I feel compelled to share a piece of learning that my son brought back from school, and I'm gonna trust this is verifiable, but he said when they were studying the Constitutional Convention and history, one of the things they looked at was how the bar bill went up the longer it went. Yeah. Uh, 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 so. Um, who paid the tab, I yeah, wonder. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, there, uh, um, and who preserved the tab. Right. Um, but Steve, you had a comment. Well, yeah. um, well there's, uh, there's an interesting uh, number of letters that went back and forth between Madison and Jefferson. Jefferson was, was in Paris at the time. And Jefferson was very much for a Bill of Rights, Madison not. And um, Madison said, essentially, that he, he thought a Bill of Rights would be parchment protections. Parchment, parchment protections. Bear meaning that it's really not worth the, the paper it's written on, because if it's not inherent in the people, um, it's not going to be upheld. And just putting that on a piece of paper is really not going to help. Jefferson wrote back and said, well, you know, the, the people deserve these rights. It's part of natural law, but it's also part of, of the, the, it should be part of the compact of government. And also he said something that's, that's really interesting and has relevance today, which is that um, if there was a Bill of Rights, it would put power in the judiciary an to judiciary. an independent judiciary, right, to enforce those rights if Congress um, passed legislation to, to, to violate those rights. And that was a very um, forward-looking uh, statement. Um, I mean, the Supreme Court did not have the power of, it not been, had not been established that they had the power of review at that point. But of course, the Supreme Court has, and the federal courts in general, been the guardian of our rights when they've been challenged. And um, the whole history of the last half of the 20th century has been, at least in the area of First Amendment, freedom of speech and freedom of the press, has been an expansion. Well, and there was a rights. tradition of judicial review in the, in the Virginia judiciary. There was, it, it wasn't like it was invented whole cloth with Marbury versus Madison. So when Jefferson's writing about that, he's already kind of ironically given his subsequent disagreements with John Marshall, saying that courts do have this important role to play. So Ralph, I want to come back to um, some of your comments earlier, uh, um, and some of what you've written in your book about dissent. And of course, there are some, some subjects um, that get dealt with through dissent and eventually transform the political process. Um, quite famously, of course, with respect to slavery. Uh, tell us, let's use that as a case study to some extent. The objections to slavery, the dissent with respect to slavery, um, both in the early history and how it works out over time. Well, the, you know, it kind of uh, grew you know, immensely, you know, especially after William Lloyd Garrison began publishing The Liberator. Um, but what, what happens, what I, kind of like an overarching thing about dissent, you have dissenters that are really attacking something, like in this case, slavery. And they might be a minority of the people that are doing this. Uh, but slowly, and it takes time, they convince more and more people of the righteousness of their cause, of their ideas. And of course, this is what dissenters are trying to do. They're trying to convince people. Like, like on one hand, if you are going out on a demonstration, you know that there, there are some people that will never, ever agree with your point of view. And then there's others that do. And they're, but that's like preaching to the choir. So it's this uncommitted group in the middle that you're always trying to convince. And so in a way, dissent is almost like a, a process of erosion. 
Uh, it's a t nibbling away at a, a paradigm, an idea that a society has. And eventually, uh, it gets chipped away enough that a new one starts to form. And more and more people are beginning to uh, kind of join with the dissenters, join with, say, the abolitionist movement at that time. Uh, another thing that is kind of an interesting fact about dissent that I've noticed in my research is that once a dissent movement starts to get legs and starts to get traction and starts moving, you always inevitably have a counter dissent movement growing up. Um, for example, once abolitionists were getting really strong, you had tremendous uh, defenses of slavery being published and written by Southerners. Um, later, when the Civil War comes to an end and slavery is abolished, uh, you have the founding of the Ku Klux Klan that's trying to go back to the, the earlier paradigm. You know, the new model has created a situation that they're going to dissent against. And so it's, um, on one level, you know, dissent is kind of going against whatever the powers that be are, are at that particular moment. Right, Steve, you, you have a comment, and I just well, want you to, you, okay. If yeah. you go forward 100 years from the abolitionist movement and you get into the 1960s, you have the civil rights movement, so that's, that's kind of a follow-on. And you have another era of, of tremendous amount of dissent, especially in the South, um, against Jim Crow laws and, and other kinds of you know, segregation and, and, and so forth. And there was a, an attempt all throughout the South to shut down dissent, as Martin Luther King referred to in that speech, um, but also by, by suing. Um, the, the media, uh, the New York Times and other uh, major newspapers, the, the, uh, the television networks were sued. There, there, were, there were like you know, more than a dozen major lawsuits in the early 1960s with the intent to stop coverage of the civil rights movement in the South. So that, that gave, um, that, that resulted in the great case of the New York Times versus Sullivan um, in 1964 uh, in which the Supreme Court that was, a, that was a civil rights case, essentially. Came out of a, a, a Alabama uh, and a, um, uh, a lawsuit to punish the New York Times for covering the civil rights movement. And it gave the, this, the Supreme Court an opportunity to really address this issue of, of dissent uh, once and for all. And that's one of the great decisions in, in American constitutional history. New York Times versus Sullivan did away with seditious libel, finally, in 1964. It said that the central meaning of the First Amendment was uninhibited, robust, and wide open speech. And it came out of the civil rights struggle. And so they were, they were really intertwined, and it starts back 100 years earlier. So Linda, as you look at the dissenters over time, uh, and we've mentioned some possible models already. Um, are there any that come to your mind as uh, having particular models that may have had great impact on the uh, on the flow and development of constitutional law? Well, one of the models I'm looking at is actually what uh, Ralph already alluded to um, in terms of one of our controversial football players. We'll look at the public arena is also the sports arena, Colin Kaepernick. Um, it brings up the dissent that came before World War II involving the Jehovah's Witnesses, who at the time the U.S. flag salute was given with an outstretched arm that looked exactly like the Heil Hitler salute in Germany. In fact, Jehovah's Witnesses were being persecuted in Germany for refusing to give that salute. It leads to some key Supreme Court decisions, one of the quickest reversals in Supreme Court history, um, um, the Barnett decision and the Gobitis decision, where uh, school children was, um, Jehovah's Witness school children are refusing to stand and give the flag salute because under their religious teaching, it's saluting a graven image. And certainly extending a hand salute, which was common in um, Rome, that same kind of idea of idolatry. At first, the Supreme Court goes along with it, says that's just part of being a student teaching patriotism. A few short years later, the Supreme Court reverses itself. Robert Jackson gives the majority opinion. He later goes on 
to um, be the prosecutor at Nuremberg. And he says that we cannot, we cannot and we do not want to compel expressions of patriotism um, because that's not who we are. That's not in our nature. And it's against our First Amendment, both speech clause and religious clause. The thing that a lot of people don't know, I mean, there were violent riots at the time on that decision. There was, in uh, Nebraska, a mob castrated a man for refusing to salute the flag. So when these issues come up again in another arena, on another topic, I think it's incumbent upon us as citizens to at least know that history of dissent, why it's controversial, and also why we as a republic often haven't done too well. Now, one thing I'd like to point out about that particular, um, the football player, is you know, the First Amendment is both a civic ideal and it's a legal protection. And I have to tell you, as a legal scholar of the First Amendment, the First Amendment does not protect what Colin Kaepernick's doing. He is a private employee of a private company that could fire him in a minute. And anybody here tell me I'm wrong about that? Well, he's doing it in a public stadium. Yeah, but it doesn't. It's not about a. Uh, it's not the. Uh, a, a, it's not a content-neutral forum issue. Okay, he's a private. His employer could fire him about that. I just need to say that as a legal matter, right? <laughs> At the same time, I think it's great that we're having all these debates. Uh, but as in the past, I want us to be aware of what's the price of dissent and who has to pay it. I. As personally, I support Mr. Kaepernick's message, but as a matter of, of legal policy, he doesn't, um, he doesn't get the First Amendment protection the way someone had organized a street demonstration. Do you disagree with me about that, Michael? Let's... Uh, well, I, I, I could, but I have a question from the audience I want to okay. ask Steve. Okay. <laughs> That's my form of dissent. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, uh, because I, I want to make sure everybody you know, part of dissent is making sure everybody gets heard. Um, and so I think this goes best to you, Steve, uh, and I'll just read it. Dissent in the early colonial period was deeply embedded in a religious context. Uh, by the late 1700s, dissent had become focused on largely secular issues. Can you shed some light on the course of this transformation? How did faith uh, inform secular dissent? Well, st starting way back, um, a lot of the protest movements started in New England, and specifically Boston. And so John Adams uh, wrote in, I think it was 1765, about the, the nature of the, the, the Puritan experience breaking off from, from England. They were dissenters who came from America. So they were predisposed to, be, to, to, to carry out all the dissent against the British. It was sort of in their blood. It was in their DNA. And so there was a religious element to it. Um, there was wide participation. Uh, by ministers throughout this period. Uh, they'd get up on their pulpits and they'd thunder these sermons against the British, I mean, especially with the Stamp Act and the, and the Boston Massacre, asking for retribution, you know, um, that God demanded it. Um, you know, and, 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 and this kind of thing can, can continue. It's a very strong religious um, uh, participation. And then, of course, the, I mean, that, that perhaps, you know, fades out a little bit and, and becomes more secular. But even, you know, um, you get to, again, to the Civil Rights Movement, Martin Luther King, his invocation of, of um, you know, religious ideals uh, and, and all that. So it, 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 it never leaves us. And I think you see it today. Um, certainly, there's a lot of um, religious dissent from um, uh, various requirements, um, you know, the Hobby Lobby case and, mm -hmm. and so forth. And, and dissent from the, the idea that, that a, uh, you know, someone who bakes cakes should have to serve a, a couple, uh, you know, a gay couple that's marrying. I mean, th those are acts of dissent that bring up religious values. So I don't think it's ever quite left us. So, and Ralph, you, you've written in your book about patterns of dissent in the past, and I want to ask you this question from the audience, because I think to some extent it has to do with the, what patterns may be evident in the dissent today. But here's the particular question. How do you account um, for the greater openness of dissent today as opposed to the civil rights era um, and before that the McCarthy witch hunts? Well, I think um, one of the legacies of the 1960s is that it really helped put dissent on the map. And 
because of the protests against the Vietnam War, the civil rights protests, and uh, the emphasis that Martin Luther King had on civil disobedience and nonviolent resistance, even though you know, certainly some dissent has descended into violence, but uh, I think most Americans have learned to appreciate nonviolent dissent. And you know, our society is becoming more diverse, not just ethnically, but you know, like the, uh, with sexuality and so many other things. And uh, more and more people are kind of loosened up, in a sense, because of the 1960s. And I think uh, you, like, once the Vietnam War comes to an end, once the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act are passed, uh, some of those really big issues at the time seem to have been settled. I mean, they haven't really been, but they, they appeared to people. And then uh, in the aftermath of that, you suddenly had what I sometimes call the mobilization of minorities, uh, whether it's the women's movement, the uh, American Indian movement, the Chicano movement, uh, even uh, the Grey Panthers. Have you guys ever heard of the Grey Panthers? Maggie Kuhn <laughs> in Philadelphia? Yeah. For senior back. citizens' rights, yeah, we're we're here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you know, like everybody was getting involved, and and it wasn't some of those really huge issues like with with the Vietnam War or civil rights, but kind of w issues that affected smaller and smaller groups. So I think it's become pretty much accepted that uh, you know people are going to be dissenting about a lot right. of different things. So Linda, I am gonna come back to your question, but in a somewhat indirect way. Um, but in regard to um, um, pro athletes, I think one of the many things that may come into play are the contracts they have with their That's particular the employers. Um, and um, it would be interesting to consider what forms dissent may be permissible. For example, could he choose not to play as a form of dissent? Consequences, uh, right. And, and, uh, and so I wanna ask you, I, I have a, a card here, it's asking about three different people, but I'm gonna limit this to just uh, maybe one, and that's Snowden as a dissenter. Uh, he had a different kind of contract. Um, and so is Snowden a dissenter? Can we treat him as such? Uh, the question really has to do with why he can be persecuted. I think we probably know the answer to some extent, but it may be helpful to elaborate that. Yeah. Um, the First Amendment doesn't give you an unequivocal right to violate other instant law. Uh, as the late Judge Justice Scalia would say, even for religious purposes. So it's important to remember that we have First Amendment ideals of freedom of speech and freedom of expression that go throughout our society, but what gives the First Amendment oomph, uh, as Thomas Jefferson would say, is an independent judiciary where there is uh, no remedy, there is no right. You have to be able to go to court and enforce it. So, um, <clears throat> remind me of the second part of the question. I, I was really the, asking about form of dissent and what the, the form of dissent, but specifically with pro athletes, right? So, uh, well, if you want to come no, back, to that's right. That's what I knew. Yeah, I was I'm sorry, something. wasn't sure which part you didn't hear. The, the Grey Panthers <laughs> are definitely coming back, um, <laughs> and and I can say that with Mr. Snowden. So he signed contracts that limited what he could do as a national security contractor. Um, I'm a big believer in, in facing the consequences. We may decide as a society not to persecute, not to prosecute, etc. But if there's, and Dr. King was the perfect example of this. He obeyed every court order. He went to jail when he was commanded to go to jail. There is this idea of if you believe strongly enough in your dissent, you pay the consequences in part to prick the consciences of your federal citizens. So Mr. Snowden, um, I'm personally glad that the information was made aware, uh, but I'm not his boss of the national security agents. Whether or not he fits under whistleblower law, which under the Obama administration has been interpreted quite tightly. The Obama administration has been very hard on whistleblowers, um, but Right now, compared to other dissenters, he, in my opinion, is not paying a huge price for the scope of what he did. That's my opinion, and I consider myself a free speech advocate. But until he can get some kind of deal with the Justice Department, he's in Vladimir Putin's free speech. Okay. And 
again, I don't, I don't criticize what he did. I'm just saying consequences. Okay. Ralph? Yeah, I was just, you know, one, people, my students were always asking me what I thought about Snowden because he's a hero with the students, that hero. younger generation. And, and you know, and I uh, agree, and I think it's good what he did this, but it's not really your classic civil disobedience in the way that Martin Luther King or Henry David Thoreau would do it because they were saying when there's something that, an injustice that you have to stand up right. about, you, you break a law, but you're willing to pay the price for that right. law. Like now, if, if Snowden had done that revelation and said, here I am, turned himself in, he'd be a martyr in prison right now. But he kind of fled off you know, to Hong Kong and then Russia and all that. So it's, you know, he's, he's done this without you know, accepting the consequences of it. So in a sense, you know, I, I think of him much more as a whistleblower than as a dissenter. Well, and, and I will say that some of the most eloquent passages about the meaning of the Fourth Amendment are in my book on the Constitution quoting Mr. Snowden. So I salute this generation's commitment to fully understanding and applying those freedoms. And I personally think he was right in the judgment he made, even though my husband was a survivor of the 9-11 attack on the Pentagon. So I take national security very seriously. But this is exactly the kind, of, these are the kinds of things that we as citizens have to be involved in, determined, and as our fellow panelists have said, that's the true test of any constitutional rights we have. And well, as we recognize, and Steve, I'm gonna to come to you first on this, um, as we recognize people will dissent for a lot of different reasons. Some is just to stop whatever's happening. Some may have a different agenda. Um, and to some extent, that is one of the things, of course, people were talking about with regard to George Mason. Um, lots of people are, dissenting today to, the, uh, to our Constitution and to the way it looks. Uh, and, and actually, a large number of states have already approved a constitutional convention. So I'm wondering to what extent those, uh, what might be the issues that would come up in a constitutional convention if it were held today? I'm afraid everything. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. it. <laughs> Especially uh, the First mind. Amendment. I mean, that's, that's, that's the big danger. Uh, look, the, the, one of the reasons why Madison did not want a second convention to resolve the, the, the problems that people like Mason had. He said, you gotta vote up or down on, on the Constitution because we will never be able to have another convention like the one in Philadelphia, where people eventually came together and they, and they, they formed a new government with a, with a, with a Constitution. It, 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 things will get too, um, people get angry, people, or there's already divisions in a country, and it, it, you'll, you'll never have a constitution that way. So vote it up or down, and we'll have, con we'll have amendments l later on. That was his position. Um, I think the same thing applies today. I, I don't see in this political climate, once you open up the constitution to another convention, what is gonna happen? Ralph, that's a sequel to your book. So yeah, right. <laughs> uh, well, the, the patterns of dissent today, do you see any? Um, Yes, to, like one thing I've been thinking about lately is like with the Black Lives Matter movement. And if you go back to, like I mentioned earlier, when slavery was ended, uh, you had the rise of the Ku Klux Klan. You had reconstruction period and then after reconstruction, uh, the Jim Crow laws come into effect and, and all this. And so it seemed like with this advance that African Americans had, which was abolition of slavery, and the, the 15th Amendment giving black men the right to vote. With that advance, you had this um, white backlash to it. Um, and then with the, it's, with the significant changes and advances of the civil rights movement, uh, you had a backlash to that, which comes in the form of the get tough on crime, um, the mass incarceration, there was you know, attempts to you know, take the teeth out of the Civil Rights Act. Um, you had like specific episodes like the Attica prison thing where it was just a, a total clampdown. And you know, historians are now beginning to call that the second reconstruction, you know, the, the white reaction to the civil rights, successes of the civil rights movement. And it kind of struck me that what's happening 
uh, now with, the, with Black Lives Matter and this whole thing about the police brutality uh, and the rise of you know, the rhetoric of people like Donald Trump, it's almost like this is a third reconstruction because it's kind of a, a, re, a reaction to the presidency of our first African-American president, you know, mm -hmm. because there's these you know, significant advances on the lines of race with you know, abolition, civil rights, first African-American president, and there's these major backlashes happening to that. So our time is almost done, but I want to come back to each of you for any kind of final thoughts about the set. I'll start with you, Linda. Well, I, I want to do a footnote to the, my interpretation, at least the way I was taught in law school, about the First Amendment and how it does and does not protect dissent. Using Mr. Kuypernick as an example, um, I was speaking mainly in terms of private contract law. And most people, unless they're employee of the state, do not have a First Amendment right against their employer. If your employer wants to fire you for saying some disagreeable opinion, unless you've got it protected in your contract, if you're a union employee or elsewhere, you don't have a f general freedom of speech right vis-a-vis um, -vis private parties. So I want to make that clear. I also can say that I don't think in uh, a football game that that's uh, really a public forum because it's for a limited use. But the point is, is to try and understand what all these tensions are between what the First Amendment does protect, what it doesn't, and then the general values of freedom of expression that we want to encourage throughout our society. Thank you. Steve? Uh, I would go back to what James Madison wrote in 1800. I think he had a full understanding of how dissent was a part of the fabric of the government that had been created, the idea that in a self-governing society that had been established by the Constitution, you had to have protection for dissent. Otherwise, you simply couldn't have a self-governing people. It would be more like the government that they had rebelled against, where you defer to the king, you defer to parliament. That wasn't what they had set up. And so these two things work um, very closely together. You can't have the self-governing society without protection of dissent. Thank you. And Ralph? Yeah, I, liked, I think of um, back when I was a kid in the 50s, and, and I can think some, probably some of you guys can remember this too, that you know, in school we were taught every day that we live in the greatest country on earth. You know, because everybody's free and equal. You know, we, I, I remember gladly saluting the flag and feeling extremely proud of being an American and thinking how lucky I am to be born on the greatest in the greatest country on earth. And then in 1957, you see on television news these nine black kids being escorted to Little Rock Central High School by the 101st Airborne. And something, it didn't gel, you know, like, you know, we live in the greatest country on earth, everybody's free and equal, but it's not quite true. And I think this is what propelled the dissent movements in the 1960s, is that so many young people, of which I was in the, that generation at the time, and felt that, well, this is the greatest country on earth, but there are a few things that need to be fixed, and so we'll do that. What we wanted to do was to make the reality in the United States more closely resemble the ideal, the picture that we have of ourselves. And this, to me, is one of the most important things about dissent. Thanks. Um, I want to remind everybody that we have a reception downstairs. Um, Steve and Linda also have their books on sale in the bookstore here. Um, and I'm going to um, assume you're going to agree with me that there could be no dissent that we've been very lucky today with both our panels, and I appreciate your being here today. <laughs>